uh, the chair of Swan Enhancement Project's Task Force for the Reduction of Substance Abuse. And over the past three years, um, we've held uh, several forums, actually. Um, back, I think, two years ago, we had Project Vision from Rutland Up, and we did some all-day um, events during the day with um, regional providers, and then did a community outreach. We've done um, with Beth Crane in the um, Franklin County Care and Community Team, we've done several events. We did Seeing Through the Smoke, um, for one. And then um, through that Child Abuse Vermont and Heather Nipat, we've done uh, the movie showing of police events. So it has been the mission of the Swanton Enhancement Project Task Force to um, make Swanton a hub for information around um, substance abuse. So if we do nothing else, that's what we're hoping to do, is to help this region um, understand exactly what it is that we're, we're dealing with. So tonight's um, forum, it was actually conceived, the idea of it, probably two and a half plus years ago, and it's taken us this long to, to get it to this level. But we have a great group um, here to speak to you tonight. Um, we have our keynote speakers, Jolinda LeClaire, and Jolinda is the Vermont Director of Drug Prevention Policy. Um, and that's a new role for her, and I, I know Jolinda, and I know she's already doing amazing things. So we'll hear from Jolinda. And then we have Commander Matthew Crowley here. And Matthew was with us last time that Project Vision came. And, um, and we were all impressed then, and I'm sure we will be in tonight as well. And now he is um, the Executive Director. For project vision. So, um, welcome, Matthew. Um, we as well have a group of panelists. Dr. Ed Hawk is here from the Notch um, Swamp Notch Center. Beth Crane will be one of the panelists as well, um, and from Franklin County Caring Communities. Heather Nickhead, the coordinator for Prevent Child Abuse Vermont. Dr. Chipanelli from Northwestern Pediatrics and um, the RISE BT team, we have Betsy Fournier and Debbie Robertson. And then, um, as well, we're start, and our moderator um, is uh, Michelle Monroe, the executive um, editor for the St. Albans Messenger. So those are our official guests. We do have some great teams here. I see a bunch from the NMC team, the RISE BT Human Services Division, both rehab, uh, CWS. We even have our superintendent in the room. Where is Wynn Goodrich? There he is, Superintendent Wynn. And um, the SWAT Enhancement Project, of course, um, Hank and Molly Lambert. So we welcome all of you. I'd like to thank a couple of people quickly. Um, first, Beth Crane for, for helping to do um, all of this work with me. I've dragged her in many times and probably still will again, Beth. Um, Lucy Hill is here from our, our task force. Lucy's here and she's at everything we do, so thank you, Lucy, for who you are. There she is back there. And also, as well, uh, Sandy Kilbert from the task force, as well as. Um, um, Alyssa Henry is here, and she is the VISTA worker for um, regional planning, and they were kind enough to give her to me. She doesn't quite know what she's gotten herself into, but she did a lot of this work for us today, as well as Adrian is here from um, the VISTA, and Adrian will be leaving the community, so thank you for your help, Adrian. So, um, we will first start out with um, having Jolinda present what is happening um, at the statewide level towards prevention. And then we will go to Commander um, Prouty, who will discuss um, the, the things that are happening in a very successful community um, uh, around prevention. And then we'll move on to our, our panelists. Each of them will speak for about five minutes and tell um, us what they're doing relative to prevention in their respective roles. And then we'll open up for questions and, and answers. So we're going to have quite a bit of time to do that. Um, so first, Jolinda. Thanks very much, Kathy. Really nice to be here in Swanton tonight. I was surprised how quickly I was able to make it from downtown Burlington. I think it took 
me longer to get to the interstate than it did from the interstate to exit 21, which is always a good thing. Um, and given that we have the uh, Commissioner of, of the Department of Public Safety on the council as one of the tri-chairs, um, I, I, I don't use any, any favors, that's for sure. So, um, as Kathy said, I think I met Kathy about 25 years ago doing workforce issues. I know, Kathy, we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't tell our age. Um, I have worked across the state for many, many years. I started my career in 1983 working for then Congressman Jeffords, who became Senator Jeffords in 1988 and uh, left office in 2006. And um, my last role was as Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. And so I actually spent quite a bit of time up here in Franklin County. And I have to say, even though working on the topic of substance use disorder and opioid use disorder in particular is a great challenge, I am not sorry that I am not focused on some of the huge lake challenges that I know all of you continue to face. And it will be something that um, will always be near and dear to my heart, and we all have to work on that together. So I'll use a statement that we used um, in the Shumlin administration, and it was, we had to be all in, and I'm looking at Denise Smith right now. Um, we had to be all in in terms of handling the challenges, environmental challenges, with Lake Champlain. And when you talk about substance use disorder, we also have to be all in. This is not a disease that has any socioeconomic dividing lines. It touches every community and almost every family that I have spoken to across the state of Vermont. Um, Vermont is now the second most rural state in the nation. And I say second, and many people never even knew that we were up that high because you think of Vermont as being small. But when you look at the USDA definition of rural, which means um, towns with populations of 2,500 or less, Vermont is number two. And we only landed there a year ago, and Maine has surpassed us. So we would always, I mean, I used to always think it should be Wyoming or North Dakota or some other big western state, and that is not a fact. And I'm looking at Molly Lambert right now and saying she knows this very, very well because she was the former state director of USDA Rural Development and she followed me in that position. So um, my 30 plus years of public service landed me here and it probably will be my last big job and it feels like one of the most important things I've ever done in my career. Um, last year, 2016, there were 106 Vermonters who died of an opioid overdose death. There were thousands and thousands of Vermonters, and I'm sure all of you in this room know that, who had an opioid overdose. We are fortunate in the state of Vermont that so many first responders believe in, carry, and implement naloxone, otherwise known as Narcan. And we can feel really proud of that. We can also feel really proud of Vermont's system of treatment for opioids. We have a hub and spoke system here in the state, and I'm looking here in the front row, and I'm looking in the back here at Jill Barry Bowen, who is the CEO of Northwest Medical Center and sits on the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council. Um, we have a system of treatment here in the state which surpasses almost any other state. We have a delegation from Wisconsin arriving on Thursday to look at Vermont's hub and spoke system. We have the First Lady of North Dakota arriving later this week to look at the hub and spoke system. And there's a reason why, is that we do things well in this very rural state in terms of partnerships. So I want to commend you, Kathy, and all the people who are part of this initiative here today. What we know, and Matt is going to talk about this more, is that community-based coalitions do a great deal to reduce stigma. It allows people to talk about substance use disorders and other really tough to tackle issues. 
such as suicide. Um, in a school like this, and I'm, I'm not aware of what the prevention programs are here in Franklin County in detail, what I know is that Franklin County does a really good job talking about and implementing prevention programs. Governor Scott issued executive order number two on January 5th, the day he was inaugurated. And executive order two created the position of the director of drug prevention policy, which is my position, and it also created the opioid coordination council. The charge is to better integrate programs across state government and with the federal government and drive resources <laughs> to communities, individuals, and families who need these resources. So after 30 years in public service, I can say, because I've lived this, that we do a decent job in Vermont partnering across agencies and partnering across the public, private, and nonprofit sector. In some areas, we do better than others. We also know that we still have silos. And however you want to uh, define them, we need to do a better job integrating the various programs and the resources that we have. The Agency of Human Services is about half of state government. There are six departments in that agency. The Department of Health, the Department of Mental Health, um, the Department of Aging and Independent Living, the Department of Vermont Health Access, and I'm sure I will forget a couple that are incredibly important. Um, many of them operate various programs which overlap. Um, programs which are here at your community door and they're here in your schools. Prevention programs, treatment programs, recovery programs. I don't know if there's anybody here from the recovery center in Franklin County, but we also have a really, really strong system of recovery centers and a Vermont recovery network. In comparison to investments we make in other things, we need to make greater investments in recovery centers. We need to make greater investments in prevention. And those are some of the things that the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council are looking at right now. So we're working to identify best practices. We are working to identify gaps in resources. There are many parts of this state which have much fewer resources than others. There are also parts of the state, and I'll use Rutland's Project Vision as an example, which have a best practice, and we can replicate those best practices. I want to hear from you tonight. What are the things that you think that the state can do better in terms of integrating programs, melding resources, leveraging resources? And I'm not going to pretend that there is an ample amount of new resources. There are not. All of you read the newspaper, and you all have your own budgets that you're working on. However, if we can identify the work that is working, and we can look where there may be redundancies, and <coughs> frankly, um, not as robust integration of programs, I, I think we probably can come up with some additional resources. Prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement are the four drivers of Vermont's response to the opioid challenges. And there are four pathways to affect change. We look at policy, we look at program, we look at infrastructure, and we look at investment. And investment is not just public sector. There are many other resources that we can identify. There's philanthropy. I've received three phone calls since I've been in this position from people in Vermont who want to invest philanthropic dollars somewhere. We need to be very clear about where. There, there are levers for change that we can identify. And we are close to identifying a first set <coughs> of levers for change. The Opioid Coordination Council met yesterday, and Jill was sitting there, and we identified a set of recommendations, strategies, that can improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges. Some of these are short term, some of these are mid term, and some of these are longer term. When you think about creating a statewide messaging campaign where all of us can say the same thing, addiction is a disease, and there are pathways to recovery, 
And those pathways are different for everybody. Treatment is available. As I mentioned earlier, we have a really strong system for treatment here in the state of Vermont. We can do better with raising public awareness and reducing stigma. That means bringing partners together from the public, private, and nonprofit se sector into one room, amplifying the messages that are already coming out of the Department of Health and the alcohol and drug abuse programs, and creating an elevator speech, a, a post office speech, however you want to call it, where we all can say something similar. Goals. Really important to talk about goals, and I want to make sure I get back to these. Um, the council has identified a number of things that we want to reduce and increase. We want to reduce the number of people with substance use disorders. We want to reduce the annual number of opioid overdose deaths. We want to de reduce the numbers of babies born into addiction. We want to reduce the number of children in state custody as a result of substance use disorders. I'm sure many of you have read, there are over 250 children in state custody today as a result of the challenges that families face with substance use disorders. We want to reduce the number of opioid prescriptions written each year. The Department of Health has come a long way with issuing a new set of prescriber rules which went into effect on July 1st. We can do more, not only with provider education, but with patient education. How many of us walk into a doctor's office and have somebody say to us, I will give you a prescription? And how many of us then think, maybe there are other options for me? Maybe there are non-pharmacological approaches to pain management which we can consider. That is another thing that the Opioid Coordination Council is looking at. We want to reduce the number of youth using illegal substances in the first place. And we want to reduce the supply of illicit drugs in Vermont. What do we want to increase? We want to increase the number of people in treatment. And the opening of the BART Center last week, it was the grand opening. They've actually been open, I believe, for over six weeks. That is an incredible step and resource here in Franklin County. We want to reduce, or, I'm sorry, increase the number of people in recovery who have housing, jobs, and social supports. One of the things we're very clear about is that the pathway to recovery must include a home, some kind of roof over your head, and a job, as well as the wraparound healthcare and human resource supports. And finally, we want to increase the number of students who have access to school and community-based prevention supports throughout Vermont. That set of goals is driving what the Opioid Coordination Council is focused on. We'll have a set of about 20 recommendations to present to the governor, again, crossing prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. And I will highlight education and intervention, which are critical components of prevention. And with that, I'm sure I have gone over, and I'd be happy to answer questions after Commander Crowley has his opportunity to speak. Thank you.
So it's not that we couldn't see well or we thought we saw something <laughs> different. It's that every grant application needs a great name. So we have this acronym for Viable Initiatives and Solutions Involving Neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get the grant. <laughs> but, but the name stuck. Uh, so the city of Rutland has had the tremendous benefit of a lot of problems. So you come up with a lot of solutions when you're dealing with a lot of really bad problems. And in the early 2000s, leading up to 2010-ish, um, the city just about had it. Uh, the city had it with the police department. The police department had it with the city. The union had it with the management. Management with the union and everything in between. And then something tragic happened. Carly Farrell, a rising star in Rutland City, 17 years of age, working at a local discount food in the uh, lower northwest neighborhood of Rutland City. Waiting, her father's waiting in the parking lot to pick her up, which is right next to the door as she walks out. She's careened into uh, at a car, by a car going about 65 miles an hour with the operator of that vehicle uh, was helping while in the car with other folks. That case hasn't been adjudicated. I believe he's serving uh, seven to ten years, some lousy sentence like that. But what came out of that was this galvanizing situation where we're going to do something. We can't go on like this. Our streets are falling apart. Um, we were, were just losing the battle. So. Jim Baker was our chief of police, then former colonel of Vermont State Police. He said, you know what? We own a lot of problems in Rome that have absolutely nothing to do with law enforcement. So we're going to start looking at all these issues. We're going to start inviting some people to the table. We're going to invite some folks from the community. We're going to invite some folks from mental health. We're going to invite some folks, some folks from probation and parole and other state agencies. And two things are going to happen. We're either going to work really well together or we're going to smoke these bastards out. <laughs> and uh, we're going to expose it for not doing the work. And I apologize, I have a master's degree in street patrol. <laughs> sometimes my mouth gets uh, so I apologize in advance. But what came out of that was actually awesome. So we got in a room with a whole bunch of people and we said, listen, we're getting blamed for every social issue known to man. So who do you call at 3 o'clock in the morning when Johnny's running down the street naked? You call the police. And then the police run and tackle this naked guy. Not willingly, they didn't want to do that. But it had to happen because the neighborhood's in turmoil. But Johnny's been off his medication for three months. Johnny has a payee and a case manager from uh, Rubble Mental Health. When's the last time someone was in Johnny's apartment and talked to him and, and heard him talk about the green guys running across the windowsill. Okay? Those were the things that we're talking about, that there are a few things were falling through the gaps. Crises were being scheduled at the ER. Have you ever scheduled a mental breakdown? <laughs> hey, next Wednesday, why don't you fall apart, come into the ED, and we'll get you. Okay? That's a problem. Uh, people on supervision, that are getting credit for serving a jail sentence that are using every day. I had an individual that served seven months in the state of Connecticut while on supervision in Vermont, and Vermont didn't know. Okay, these were big problems. I have one street in this neighborhood that if something happens, whether the cat walks across your lawn, they call the police, and then another neighborhood where people are literally getting shot at, nobody calls. That's an issue. Okay, these are sort of, so why did no one call? Well, if they call the police, no one's going to come here and do anything about it anyway, so why bother calling? That hurts. Okay, that hurts. And your police department said, boy, I've really lost the legitimacy in this neighborhood. How do I get it back? So we had this series of community meetings, and man, did we take, so take a pounding. But what came out of that is we found that there, are, there were still people in neighborhoods that really care about the state of the city that wanted to do something about it and we got skin in the game. So the first part was really brutal, but what came out of that was we identified some community leaders, neighborhood leaders, partnered them up with law enforcement, 
<coughs> assigned officers to certain neighborhoods so that there was ownership and we held people accountable. So why are the police involved with the medical part of all of this? They have a good question. I'm going to answer. <laughs> One of those reasons is that out of this collaborative and the success that we've had at Ralph is because today, from all of this work that we've done, I have 41 mobile kiosks. And what that is, is I've got a police department, 41 officers, that I have equipped with a resource guide for Ralph Mental Health, for regional community uh, access to health care, to Turning Point Recovery Network, to Western uh, Clinic for, uh, for Addiction and Recovery, to uh, Dale Rob's uh, Serenity House down in Wallingford, to all of these different organizations, which means kind of going, anyone see the New York on 34th Street? You go into Macy's and they didn't have a product, so what did they do? They went to the book, they went to the flyer, they found uh, that item they were looking for at another store, and what did people say? Wow, I'll go back to Macy's because they cared enough about me as a customer that they referred me to a place that's their competitor because they wanted what was best for me. So it's that no wrong door method. And then we started having real success. We started meeting as groups, um, both within the police station and outside the police station. And we said, how are we going to formalize this? So we came up with three committees. We didn't want a lot of rules because we didn't want a board of directors and all that stuff with bureaucracy and everything else. So we found ourselves a cheerleader, and he was a retired executive from Central Vermont Public Service that was uh, taken over by Great Mount Power, Joe Krause. Real exciting guy, real positive guy, great energy, and we needed that. The three committees we broke up to be pretty simple. Crime and safety, self-explanatory. The second part was building great neighborhoods. Fantastic. And the last one was substance abuse and treatment. We have changed that to community health. So we meet monthly at a little church in the house center. We get approximately 70 people from noon to 1.30 every month. And then we've had consistently approximately 70 people or more for three years running. And the reason that we keep getting people coming back is because we're meeting our outcomes. We're meeting our outcomes because sometimes you got to let the dog catch the bus. You know what that means? I got a great idea. Great. What do you want to do? Well, I want to do this, this, and this. Fine. You can take the lead on that. You got the budget. You got the. Okay. So you do that a couple of times. You find out who your rock stars are, the people that can really get things done. You start to network. And now you have all these people that are now partnered with Habitat for Humanity building another house. You have neighbor works that are partnered with uh, Rutland Redevelopment. And then the police for seizing properties with the federal government giving them to the city, who's now turning it over to NeighborWorks for de-densifying a neighborhood um, that at one point was 27% owner-occupied with the goal of making it 51% owner-occupied. We're doing things like that. So this community health piece got together and they said, there are some things that we want to affect. We have this opioid crisis. We have people literally leaving, uh, going to the ER for mental health treatment. Uh, what are we going to do about that? So inside the vision center at the police station, and actually uh, Franklin County is really good about this too, we have a full-time 40-hour week crisis clinician inside the building. I cannot tell you how awesome <coughs> that is. It wasn't easy. The, the lady that we picked, Alicia Armstrong, she's a fantastic professional, but she's, she's a hippie lady. <laughs> First time we brought her to the police station, like, man, this ain't going to go well. <laughs> it gets better. So, like, uh, we started with some ride alongs. I'm like, uh, hey, who's going to take Alicia out? <laughs> Quiet. So, in the police, the police broke, we are a paramilitary organization. We tell people what they're going to do. Yes, sir, I did. And they go. But what happened was, we went to a call, there was a person in crisis. Alicia already knew the person. She knew their case manager. It wasn't something that was going to require hospitalization. It was a quick fix and a tweak on some medication, and that was a success. 
we got really good about celebrating success. When you have a success in your collaborative, make sure you're telling your story, because if you're not telling your story, somebody else is. And that somebody else usually doesn't have the information, they're very negative, and you know, on there, on Facebook, on the time. So we started doing that. After a while, people started seeking out Alicia because she knew the population and she could write an emergency evaluation warrant in about 45 minutes as compared to the four hours it took us. And it was seamless. And believe me, if you can make a copy of this paperwork, you become very relevant. Okay? And now I've got these two disciplines that are working together. The mental health community in that crisis network, they don't like the police. We just throw people in jail and we just incarcerate all these mental health people. And it's just and then over here, you're like, these people are letting crazy people just run all over the community and do nothing, right? So when we started sitting in the same room, we started understanding each other's other challenges, each other's concerns, how we do our business, that we're not just a bunch of guys out tackling naked people because we want to. <laughs> if you don't want a fixed response to a mental health situation, I suggest you have some mental health people who were there before to get to that. So, so that started happening. So we said, you know what, in all of these aspects of what we're doing at the police department, we need to start celebrating success when we can. So now I have two, uh, I've been put two other social workers in the police station. They work with strength, strengthening families, uh, early childhood intervention. And I gotta tell you, these, these, case, these case managers have the toughest cases you'll ever see. You have to have a child, you identify, the family identifies what the structure looks like in the family. But someone in that household is under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. They're about to lose their kid to DCF. Uh, one or more people has a substance abuse issue. And I mean, it, these were just disasters. And we're talking about case managers that were walking into these houses, telling people how to do laundry, how to wash dishes that they should do. I mean, basic, basic, basic things, OK? And every once in a while, you got a, a, a crazy meeting that's going to happen, and they're scared to death. And the the one parent in the in the home is six foot three, all tatted up, uh, ag assault guy, and he wants to kill the case manager. So we'll have that meeting at the police station, <laughs> and we'll just happen to be working by the copier while you're having your meeting and walking back and forth. <laughs> and this was the politest guy you have ever met in your life. And then we introduce ourselves. And we say, boy, it's really great that you are here and that you're invested in your child and your family's lives. And is there anything else you need to be successful? Because we're here to help. Oh, I need a piece of furniture. I have a listserv of over a thousand people. It's a 15-minute miracle. I put a thing out on the listserv. Hey, Johnny needs a, a, a refrigerator. Last year, I delivered my first refrigerator. <laughs> the police do that problem. And they said, well, why are the police deliver, uh, delivering a refrigerator? Why not? Okay. That's the question. So this collaborative has become very relevant. So one of the things that also came out of this, uh, of our health community piece that I want to share with you, I want to share with you some of their focus right now. And this group is, like I said, it's, it's one committee of our three committees. And uh, they have one admission assessment for substance abuse treatment. Just one. So Westridge. Uh, private suboxone providers, MAT providers, um, Howard Center, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. If you have more than one, everybody is using the same assessment form. Uh, there's one wait list for your MAT. Okay. Uh, they're expanding the screening and referral focus, focus on adolescent suicide and mental health. Why is that? Because a lot of our folks that are, that are having this substance abuse disorder fall into several of those camps. Why not do the screening at the same time? And after you do that, partner with those other professionals at the same time. Another thing that we're using in Rutland County is uh, a universal consent form that's been vetted by Rutland Regional Medical Center. Okay, we're talking about getting uh, uh, getting away from those redundancies. Let professionals talk and expanded use of a shared care plan. Relevant Regional Medical Center, some of this stuff is pretty complicated. I sit on this board and I'm like, hey, I don't get it. <laughs> but one of the things that they're trying to do between the, uh, the community health things that are around in the hospital is that 
there is one coordinator for your care for your care plan. So if you have a, a care provider and you're at Meadowy, whatever, you know, I mean, Indian name rivers in, in Robinson, yeah, I'm up here too, and the school for that matter. And you go to and you end up going to the hospital, that one care provider is the uh, coordinator is coordinating that care. So we're not reinventing the wheel when you go from one facility to the next. When you go into the Rutland Regional Medical Center, they're trying to do it that that social worker, that nurse, that doctor, from the time you come in the building, is going to share, to stay with you, and if, even if you get admitted second, third, fourth, or whatever, and instead of reinventing the wheel, like, well, you've left my department, you're no longer my problem, you're off to somebody else. When you're talking about quality of care, it's a little bit more work on the front end, but we're talking about better outcomes. How many people do we have that leave our hospitals every day that are going to an unsafe environment at home, whether it's because they've got uh, asthma or something silly like that, or unsafe housing, and there's something I can partner with a group like NeighborWorks, do some type of uh, assessment as to what is it like in your home that may be causing your health needs, we take care of that. Putting new carpet in an apartment is a heck of a lot less expensive than having somebody readmitted to the hospital. Okay. So these are just some, some minor examples of what we're doing in the city, but I think the biggest part is that from a police perspective, there are so many ways that each one of our disciplines can intersect with another, and if we're not looking for it, we're going to miss it. What does planting tree rub and blooms have to do with crime and safety? It has everything to do with crime and safety, because pride in a neighborhood means a lot. Why does one value system on one street that not require a lot of police service when another one's broken? When you can build pride and you can partner with folks that love planting trees and have my cop out there helping them. When you can get a group of the faith-based community that can rally the troops in no time and get someone out doing a front porch project or cleaning up a certain street and helping and helping some folks that maybe aren't. Uh, very handy in cleaning up part of the neighborhood. When you can deal with blight, when you can put officers out of the car and walking in, in the neighborhood, but no one is at a point of advantage or disadvantage. Okay, what I mean by that is you're not getting pulled over, it's not an emergency. I'm uh, walking down the street, minding my own business. If you want to talk to me, you talk to me. If you don't, mind your own business, right? What happens for that is we're building a relationship. There's something so important about having this time for us as professionals, spend time together, start under understanding each other's discipline. I had a great conversation with our rep here from uh, the Turning Point here in Franklin County. This morning I listened to a seven minute and 28 second nine and text story on BPR about Tracy Hawks Turning Point in Rutland City. They are doing God's work in the Marble Valley Regional Correctional Facility and having fantastic outcomes. And they're volunteers. Okay. Tracy gets paid. But outside of that, I mean, these are the things that we need to tap into from the state level, from the local level, supporting these folks, knocking out this whole stigma. Listen, this stuff is crossing all barriers, all lines. We all know somebody that is either uh, is addicted, in recovery, has lost someone to addiction. Come on. If we're at that point now. If I can sit there as a commander of patrol, walk down the street, give someone a Westridge card, put my name on the back, call this person, okay, you're on a two week waiting list, go to recovery network and get a coach and maybe, I know you're probably gonna relapse three times, but you know what, maybe you, maybe we'll can get you through that tough phase so we don't lose folks in the gaps. Too many people are falling through. And, and then get the treatment that you need. So, again, it's tough following this act over here. Uh, but we're doing so much. And the reason that it's been successful in Rutland is one, we have a lot of problems. And when you have a lot of problems, you're going to have some success if you're doing something. But beyond that is that, you know, we kind of, we all get rid of the pride, get rid of the ownership of all your own stuff, and say, who am I, who is not at the table that could be at the table? Reassess that constantly. Because there's so much talent out there for these professionals. And when they're sitting down in a room, we have this thing called the coffee clutch, the mental health folks did. And once a month at 7.30 in the morning, they do this coffee thing, and they bring in all these mental health professionals.
And I can't tell you how many problems are being solved on, re on referrals now because somebody spent time with somebody who knew somebody that worked with adolescent youth from or from 7 to 12 specializing in this disorder. And then when you run across it, you have a name, you have a relationship, and you can call, hey, Tammy, I just ran across this, but you mind helping me with assessment later today? And this is happening all the time. And all the police department did was facilitate space. Okay. All of us can do little things like that. So thank you.
Counselors, whether they're there for only one season or many more, will remember that their efforts had an impact on children and that primary prevention begins with them, just as it did with Sandy Kilburn.
things I'd like to say. One is, I think the biggest problem with kids is boredom. And then I'd like to try to give them something to do so they don't look in other areas. Um, we also have an opioid problem. We take about 6% of the kids are using. We see a far greater amount in marijuana, probably about 35%, alcohol, about 65%. And even things like amphetamine, probably about 7%. Um, I think that we need stronger laws. I think that legalizing marijuana takes all the power we have away from trying to discourage these kids from smoking it because they figure it's going to be legal, not going to be bad. We've done very well so far with legalization. We've done very well with alcohol and cigarettes. I have to through this as well with marijuana. When I say prevention, teen centers and community centers, I think, are important. I'm going to just mention one program. This is a program out of Rancho Big Iceland. It's called the Teen Center Youth Program or Community Center Program. It's only been in existence since 1995, so it has some longevity, 22 years. This was like a thing. They had the worst alcohol problem in teens of all Europe. They decided to put their heads together and figure out what to do. They went about it a little differently than just education. They looked at the kids that weren't in trouble and said, well, what can we do to get the kids that are in trouble like the kids that aren't? And they have four or five things that they did. The first was uh, they provided activities. They built team centers, they built swimming pools, they built uh, all kinds of gyms all across the city. Uh, Retro makes the city about 120,000 people, a little bit bigger than us. They also decided that family was important. So I like, spent time educating parents on how to be parents and how to spend time with their children, which we, their, their model was quantity, not quality. I mean, you can't be a parent in half hour a week. And so they spent the quantity. They actually brought the parents and the kids in together to teach them how to be a family. They paid them to go to these sessions, and they used that money to go to the activity centers that they built around the town so they could get their food. They also worked with the schools so the kids felt better about themselves, felt caring in the schools, caring in the home. And they put a curfew. You had to be home at 10 o'clock at night. You couldn't be 16 years old walking around at 3 a.m. They put a curfew on. Um, they, they made the availability of the drugs decreased, and, um, and they did a great job to show you what they did. In 1995, 42% of their teens were in trouble with alcohol and drugs. In 2016, 5%. That's an amazing difference. Marijuana went down to 7%, cigarette smoking down to 3%. Family time increased 46%. I think if we could do that, we'd be okay. So that's my point. Here you go, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Ed Hawk, and I am the uh, medical director of NOSH and uh, the medical director of the opioid treatment program uh, within NOSH. And uh, first, I want to thank everyone here for allowing me to come and talk for a few minutes. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate that very much. And uh, congratulations, Sandy. Well deserved. Um, to start this off, um, I, it's wonderful for me to see so many talented and uh, familiar faces. I, I appreciate that very much. And I just want to start this off by saying that uh, I'm in recovery myself. So um, I approach this professionally, but I also approach this very personally. And so this means a lot to me on um, not only um, what we're doing for primary prevention, but what are we doing within the treatment program to try to prevent the next bout of things that come. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I have a sheet that uh, I hope everybody's got. And Kim Ransom is our clinical peer director. Kim, if you want to stand up. And hopefully you have a few more of but everybody should have a sheet that's called the uh, Biopsychosocial Spiritual Matrix. And I call that the right thing. And this is a very essential portion of our program. It is an essential portion of my visit uh, with every patient that I see. Um, and I'll introduce that in But what I'd like to do is I'd like to, I've got a lot of very talented people around me to talk about things in the community and Matthew talked about it and Joe and I. 
appreciate that. But I'm going to talk a little bit about why this addiction happened and what really, what are we really talking about here um, anatomically and physically? Why do people do what they do? And it doesn't seem to make sense. Why did I do what I did? It just didn't make sense. But so I just want to lay a little um, groundwork. And I'm going to use the term freely, if you don't mind, addiction, dependency, substance use disorder. It doesn't matter to me what you call it. It's, it's, it's kind of a disease. It's the same thing. So there's two principal parts of the brain involved in addiction. The frontal cortex and the midbrain. And the frontal cortex is the logical, decision-making, rational. Interestingly enough, it's also the emotional and the relationship building part of the brain. Um, and then the midbrain really is only, it's very primitive, um, respectively. And it thinks about survival. And it generally thinks of food, sex, kill. Food in order for nutrition so that we can survive. Sex so that we can have offspring that continue our lineage and kill uh, the thought of defending ourselves and others. And that's really what the midbrain does. So the different parts of the brain communicate differently. And one of those ways is by hormones. And these are called neurotransmitters. And one of these neurotransmitters is called dopamine. And dopamine is in, usually thought of in relation to pleasure, which becomes very important in this whole algorithm to me of treating uh, addiction. Um, so there is in the normal brain something we call the hedonic threshold, the hedonic pleasure threshold. And everybody's got one. And those things that you secrete enough dopamine to get above the threshold, you find pleasure. Playing with your kids, playing in different sports. Those things that you do not like to do, do dishes or a yard work, doesn't release enough dopamine. So it's not pleasure. So everybody's got this design pressure. But what happens is, is when we use substances, the release of what they found is, is that the release of dopamine is huge in relation to all this other stuff that we do. It's huge. And it literally shocks the brain. And the frontal cortex, we've made the decision to use this drug, right, in the beginning. It says to the membrane, do me a favor, man, was that good? That dose of heroin, and it's absolutely excellent. So then they do something else, and they do it again. And boom, this huge release of dopamine happens. And the frontal cortex says, midbrain, will you remember the two bags of heroin is better? Two pills of oxycontin is better than one. Can you please remember that? Yes, Well, after pss, 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 the front of the midbrain is not telling you. So what happens is, is that this hedonic threshold raises up. And so now we reset this in the addicted hedonic threshold. And what we find is we now transition to the disease. The midbrain is now taken over because this has become survival. The only thing that we feel pleasure on is the drug. The activities we used to get some release don't cross the new hedonic threshold for pleasure. So now the only thing we addicts feel is it's the drug. And we've got to have that in order to have pleasure. And the human body needs, the human being needs to have some pleasure. So that's how it gets. And so what happens in the morning with the addict, the addict wakes up, the dependent patient, the substance use disorder patient. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your offspring convention. They now wake up in the morning. And now it's the midbrain that says, Psst, George, wake up, wake up. You know, you used your last oxycodone last night. You like those functions. I love those. But you used your last one. Where are we going to get those today? We haven't even gotten out of bed. And we're already thinking about where we're going to get the drug that day. This is now survival. There's not much decision making anymore when we get to the disease. So we can talk about why does Bill do this? That seems dumb. Why does he do that? Uncontrolled use, re 
real craving and withdrawal and continued use despite negative consequences. Three hallmarks of addiction. So what they now have identified is what is addiction? Addiction is a defect in the pleasure center of the midbrain. That's what they've come to realize. We've got a problem figuring out where we're going to get pleasure from. Okay, so we'll lay that back up. Two main causes of addiction, they think, are genetic vulnerability and stress. Genetic vulnerability doesn't mean you're going to have a problem. It doesn't mean you're not going to have a problem. It means you could have a problem, depending on the other factors in your life, of which the biggest one is stress. And chronic stress happens to be exceptionally bad. I ended up having stress in my life, and I'm not here to psychoanalyze me, but I had stress in my life for a number of different reasons. So I went away to a non 12 step place. I searched out for a place called Passages Out West. Phenomenal place. I absolutely, it was the most holistic thing I've ever been to. It was phenomenal. I felt great when I came. The problem was nothing had changed in my life. I had gone to treatment, but nobody has, including me, had worked on my life. So I came back, it wasn't but three, four months, and I was drinking again. I didn't have control over this. It wasn't my decision. I did some pretty stupid stuff in getting my alcohol. But I didn't, because I was now in a mode of survival. And that's what this kind of ties together. So then I went to Betty Ford. My life I had worked on before I left. I went to Betty Ford and I was there for three and a half months. And I came back and my life had changed. A totally different program. A very 12 step. Everything was 12 step. I had to go to a meeting or two a day, everything. So what I experienced in my academics of recovery was a whole spectrum of things that we try to incorporate into our program. One of those things is this piece of paper. Is the concept of this piece of paper is biopsychosocial spiritual maker, the life makers. And to me, if we don't work on this as an adult, to get adults ready in their recovery to decrease the stress and enjoy life a little bit more, decreasing the stress, we're not going to have parents ready to have kids. We're not going to have parents um, that are going to have kids and be ready for them. It's going to be a self-fulfilling process. So this is what we do then. So these are the items to give you an idea. Everybody in the program has to have a primary care physician, has to have a dentist, has to work on these individual things. We go through this. I spend an hour, over an hour with the patient when they first come in, and I dissect them. I polarize them with questions to find out what does their matrix look like. And from that, we then extract different action items that I put into goals. And every patient has goals at the end of every visit that they come see. And we track them. And what I have experienced in my five, six years of working with patients is as their life comes together. I don't need to be a black and white program, a total abstinence-based program. And there comes a certain point, and it's very vague. It's not black and white. Actually, they don't want to screw this up anymore. They don't want to go back. They want their life to be together. They want to be a good parent. And I think as we look at different programs, we have to include life. Sounds a little vague, but if you dissect it out, each one of us may have a little stress in our life if we would address some of these areas. And we as a program do that specifically. So not only does it help the adult in our program, but when I think of the stuff that's been going on with the summer team, and we think of things like teaching kids how to canoe, teaching kids how to do certain things, those are pleasurable activities that will carry them through life. We can't underestimate the importance of pleasure. Pleasure as a family, pleasure individually, 
Because the underlying problem with addiction is it's a defect in the pleasure center of the mind. So a little different tone, a little background, hopefully that we can put some of this on. But this is kind of what I think about when I try to build on a foundation. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Hello, thank you for having me. This is an, an awesome crowd here. I'm um, very impressed by the number of people that came out on a weeknight for a community forum. So way to go, Swanton. Um, my name is Heather Niquette. I am the Family Support Coordinator with Prevent Child Abuse Vermont. We are a statewide nonprofit organization. Um, although I am involved in a number of different initiatives, my primary goal is to, to coordinate and offer parenting programs and support groups. Um, the, the curriculum that we use is the Nurturing Parenting Program curriculum. Depending on which one we're using, they run 13 to 15 weeks long. Um, during those groups, we meet weekly with parents and working on skills, um, spirituality, uh, self-care, communication, uh, empathy is really big, uh, child development. Um, we're working to build a really intentional relationship between the parents and the children, um, and to really do do some some deep thinking about maybe how we were parented and what do we want to bring forward and what do we want to change and how can we be the best support system and build that relationship with the kiddos. Um, love my job, love my groups. It's awesome. I, I think the people that that do the program are are loving it too. I always hear positive feedback from them. We just have one. Have one run Swanton every year um, that I've been in this role.
work in the, with the individuals on health coaching. We have a health coach on our team. And we also work with municipalities on changing the infrastructure in their communities on making it a safer and healthier place for our communities. Um, so I loved hearing what Matt had to say. I had the pleasure of going to Rutland with our group. Um, and one of the things that really stuck out to me tonight is um, we care enough. And the fact that you're all sitting in the room tonight means that we care enough about prevention in our communities. And I look around the room and I see so many amazing champions that I've had the opportunity to work with to make my work successful. And I support you in all the work that you do as well. So I'm honored to be here sitting with all of you. I'm not an expert. I work with some amazing experts. So I would just thank you so much for having me. to some extent, but how can we reduce 
the availability. One of the things that we're very excited about is the fact that three um, different organizations Three different organizations will now be permanent drop-off locations for uh, for any prescription medication, which gets it out of the environmental waste stream and um, also out of people's uh, medicine chests. So kudos to uh, Northwestern Medical Center, Notch, and um, uh, the uh, South Bureau Pharmacy for um, being recipients of a grant to allow uh, them to. Uh, take back med medications. Um, so there are a number of ways uh, that we're charged through our grant to work uh, on um, reducing supply. We're also very committed to um, promoting health and well-being among our youth. We are, um, we've been partnering with United Way and other organizations to support our schools to support Teen Institute, which is even the founding. Uh, initiative and the uh, health project for younger kids, uh, which again is empowering young people to take health and community well-being into their own hands. We also have a mentoring program. I can't not plug that and ask that if anybody would be interested in mentoring in a school or in the community, please uh, see me afterward or pull off a tab on uh, we have materials for that, and uh, we would love. Thank you. 
and they're everywhere, and that's great. But if you want to keep people engaged in systems, and you want people to reach out, sometimes they need a handle. Sometimes they need someone to walk with them. Sometimes they just need a sounding board. So be a little bit vulnerable. You're going to find some incredible people out there. And for the recovery people that, that work for this population, you're like, yes, talk to them. For other, for other folks, for other folks it, can be, it can be intimidating. But my piece on the prevention side is people are less likely or will be quicker coming into recovery when they know someone gives a shit and he cares about them. <laughs> is uh, for Jolinda and um, Matthew, and that is a resource question. So we heard Dr. Chip talk about the 65K and the 85K, and uh, we know that's very expensive. How does the state, uh, how does the state split the baby as the conversation goes, um, and decide? Uh, we only have so much money, and we certainly need um, treatment centers, and um, we as well need things like community centers, teen centers, um, in, in the course of prevention. And then for Matthew, how did you in Rutland split that? Because certainly the way in which you um, spent your enforcement dollars must have changed in some way um, with your community effort. So first, Linda. Thank you. Uh, this actually tease off um, a quick answer to the last question, which is really the same. Um, and it goes back to what the doctor said over here, is that communities and the state need to make a commitment to investment. Um, investment costs some money. With that said, I go back to what I mentioned earlier, is that we've gotten very complicated. We are a complex system of government at the state level and at the federal level. And if we can figure out how to better integrate the systems that we've created over many years, oftentimes we pass new laws which add another layer of policy upon another layer of program. And I think it's this moment in time where we have to drill back, uh, peel back all those layers of the onion and think about what is most important for us to deliver. Uh, I'm, I'm, for some reason, I have this gentleman whom I met over the last six months in my head who keeps saying, please don't forget about Vermont's elder population. Um, we, I, I talked earlier about Vermont being the second most rural state in the nation. We are a community of people who can become very, very isolated. And if you don't have the community centers, you don't have libraries, um, you don't have senior centers, things that are oftentimes the first to be underfunded or not funded, we are challenged. I think your point earlier is when you consider the return on investment, when you invest $1 in prevention, the return can be multiplied we have to do some data work. So one of the things that the council, uh, the Opioid Coordination Council is looking at is um, data collection and analysis. We need to better understand if you invest a dollar here, it means $5 return on investment.
we're not just going to run a program to run a program. What are your outcomes? And one of the things that we did in the police department is we stopped counting widgets. And what I mean by that is, how do we view success? And success may have looked like we wrote X amount of tic tickets, got X amount of revenue, arrested X amount of people. Well, depending on how you look at that, that could be a terrible thing or a really good thing. Well, you arrested a lot of people while wow, your town stays. You got a lot of criminals. It's a very different system when you maybe have a college do a survey of a neighborhood and say, do you feel safe? Guess what? That first survey was terrible. But now I had something to work on. Okay. So that was one of the ways that we uh, looked at how we're spending not so much money as part of the budget, but how are we spending our time? Okay, because within a 12-hour shift, we can sit in a neighborhood and with a 35 zone writing tickets all day, or we can spend time in an area that has quality of life issues and social issues and be the resource that a 24-hour, 365-day kiosk and of resources needs to be a billboard for all of these other agencies and use that as our help. Not that the other stuff isn't important, because it is. I mean, safety stuff is important. But when you're looking at how you're doing your time, if you're in an area that has very serious quality of life issues, I think that trumps the business traffic. So now I'm getting bang for my buck. We're paying an officer X amount of time per day. You know, what are you doing with that time? They say, well, I'm busy, busy, busy. Did you take a lunch today? If you have time to run radar, you have discretionary time. So what we're asking is meet with some people throughout your shift, go into three gas stations that you've never been into, introduce yourself, get out of your car, walk down a certain street, meet with six people. Well, I don't know what to say. Hey, I've got a pimp. <laughs> so that's what we did as far as getting more money for our buck. I just want to add one more thing. Um, you here in Franklin County made a, an intentional decision to invest in Rise for Mar. And I have just begun to learn about this model, which is a best practice, and now hopefully will be replicated statewide. It does not have, if I am understanding correctly, Joe Barry Bowen, it does not have public investment. It was a decision made by businesses, um, and nonprofits here in, in Franklin County to invest in the model. And that makes a tremendous statement about your commitment to investing in primary prevention. Rutland um, also made a commitment, and, and it, was a, it was a public sector commitment by the city of Rutland, if I understand correctly, um, to invest in Project Vision. So these are communities who recognize challenges um, which are beyond substance use disorders and opioid use disorders to take care of the people who are living in your communities. And I, I think that's just, you receive the highest commendations for making these choices. They are choices, tough choices. Thank you. Do you have a question? Sure. Thank you. Uh, this is just 
Don't tell the dogs. So it's <laughs> um, A few years ago, there was a study done when Jim Letty was in the legislature. So that was a long time ago. But you'll learn that you may be familiar with this. For every dollar that came into the state of Vermont, one cent was spent on prevention. And the rest of the money was spent. Most of it had a lot of enforcement before those were supposed to be able to fix it all. Um, and, and we know that that didn't work. Um, so back to what Dr. Chip said, you know, people that feel relatively good about themselves are so apt to abuse, and it goes back to bringing families together and strengthening families. And Mary Carmola once said, if you want to do something with your children, spend money so that parents can spend more time with their children.
And I know that a lot of statewide initiatives have come from Franklin County's model. And one of the things that I've always wondered about is I go through patient matrix after patient matrix after patient matrix. You know, when I look at this stuff, there is some individual variability. But you know what? When people got trouble with housing, they got trouble with housing. And when they got trouble with transportation, they got trouble with transportation. They can't get to the housing meeting because they have no transportation. So they don't have a job, so they can't fix their car to get to the meeting for housing. Um, it seems to me as though even me on the basic front end level, and I'm no specialist at anything, but I send these people to the resources that I've known over the last five or six years. I don't know that that's the most efficient way to do it. I'm wondering, is there some way that whether we do it within Swan or within Swan St. Albans or Franklin County, it, I don't know, someone smarter than me can come up with that. But is there some way that we can get everybody who primarily deals with housing in a room you know, rent out the hotel one day, and everybody with housing go here, everybody in transportation. And can we develop some kind of algorithm so that little Ed Hock, as a primary provider, can stick this person into the algorithm and let the machine take care of this? But I, and I'm not being critical, but I don't see a machine or a system integrating everybody that deals with all these things. But yet I do know on the other end, almost everybody I've got has got a problem on this page, myself included. And it would be wonderful if we as a community could wrap our arms around these resources and utilize them the best we can and integrate them. And I don't think that we're too big a community to do that. I know most of the people in this room. Yeah, you know, a good chunk of us are here. So who is it that can pick this thing up and say, you know what, this is going to be our mission and coordinate all these resources? Because I think in the end, if we build this system, we're going to use it and use it and use it, and it would be a great thing. I can tell you from my point of view, it would be a wonderful thing. Easy, maybe not. Should we go down that path? I think it'd be wonderful. investment from our housing folks because it's like going back to the hospital the hospital has somebody that they can't discharge because they have no place to go <laughs> that's not okay and that makes absolutely no sense um, so on our community health board that's chaired by dr jeff mckee who's basically a behavioral health specialist that works uh, in addiction. That's the main part of that, of their outcomes. But he's ensured that their housing is at the table. Um, law enforcement is at that table. Um, mental health is at that table. Uh, community health places outside of the hospital are at that table because we all have different budgets, different needs, different toolboxes. But everybody's got to live somewhere. And it doesn't matter if we're the greatest hospital in the world, we're the best police department, whatever. If somebody is sick and it's December and we're trying to go to a all-payer system and lower our health care costs and deliver service, but we don't have a safe place to house anyone. If you're an addict in recovery, why are we waiting for someone to get clean before we house them? When you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, does that make any damn sense? If you're on the street, you, you know, you're going to hustle to survive. So if we can take care of some basic needs like housing and then work on all that other messy stuff, it's, it's complicated, I get it. But we're keeping people alive that way. Um, and you're, you're right, you're, you're looking at your, your life lists. And there are some variables, but most of them are very similar. But housing people, um, 
I know at least in Rutland and maybe it's similar here, that transient population, they're hard to rent to. They, every landlord and their brother, they burned them. They're probably taking up a ton of economic services money with the uh, emergency housing and, um, you know, in the hotels. I mean, that, that's how Rutland's kind of set up. But having those homeless prevention people with safe rooms and contracts, and it doesn't have, we're not looking for people to be perfect. In fact, I know absolutely that they're not going to be. We know that going in. But they're assigned somebody. We deal with the messy stuff. We know where we're going to go. But we also, if we don't provide that service, the outcomes are going to be far worse. Speaking of no home, uh, I have to leave. Uh, I don't know if everybody's aware, but the teen center is has to find a new location. They're remodeling the old War Memorial building for the next It's going to be a great thing for the town, but we have to find a new home. We're going to be meeting at 730 tonight at the town offices on Church Street. If anybody wants to come and support the teen center, that would be great. Uh, we have to find a new home. Uh, and we're kind of looking at where the future is going to be. We're thinking maybe trying to make a community center instead of just a teen center, getting back to some of the stuff where you get parents involved. Uh, and uh, right now we're uh, looking at wayside furniture as one of the good possibilities for us to be there. Uh, Gordon Winters, who is remodeling the War Memorial, has given us six months rent there. We're trying to get another six months rent to keep going. We need about ten thousand dollars for that. Uh, then we're trying to look at this future as to whether we need this full community center, uh, kind of what I talked about before. But uh, I have to be there at 7.30, so I'm going to have to leave. If anybody has questions for me particularly, uh, easy to find. And uh, if you have any answers, you can just stop in the front office uh, and we can go from there. That study I mentioned in Iceland, by the way, has been picked up by 35 other countries all around the world. And Spain alone has one town with a bit over 4,200. Involved and I think they've got over 90,000 people involved, of course, the world is pretty amazing. So, anyway, if anybody wants to come, I'll be there at 7.30. You can use all the help I can get. Thank you. Dr. Cook, make sure you get a hold of USDA Rural Development. Last I knew, the uh, community was still eligible for a little bit of grant funding. You may. I just want to comment on um, your, your comment. When I think about the number of providers and resources right here in this room, um, and then I multiply it across the state, it makes my head spin. Uh, I think your point about how do you find an access point to make a connection with people has become harder and harder. I do agree, Project Vision is a really good model, and I think that every region can consider what does that look like. Rise Vermont has the foundation of being a great model. Is it the model that is going to connect with everybody? I don't have the answer for that. Um, when we think about a statewide system for resource information and referral, Right now, what we have as a state is 211. Um, recently, I went and tried to search for a family uh, that I met who had lost their son uh, from an opioid overdose about a year ago. And when I went into the portal to search, I could not come up with a statewide answer for where all the family supports are. And that's a great thing. We, we haven't spent much time talking about that tonight. But Family supports are absolutely critical. Um, so we can do better. We are thinking about how, how do we do this. Uh, 211 are three numbers that anyone can remember. People can't remember 800 numbers anymore, or they can't remember words, and then they have to go figure out what the phone number is based on the word. If there were a one-stop shop, um, and that's an old term, but a one-stop shop in every community or every county, that would be a really good start. And we're, we will continue to think about that. Anyone who has ideas, we'd love it. All right. Great idea.
real quick. I have a, I manage a listserv that has 488 people currently on it representing 100 organizations. That is nothing compared to when those folks get a request and they put it out to their respective listservs. And we have what's called the 15 minute marathon problem. Where within 15 minutes of some crazy request that I put out, someone's getting back taken care of. And it's, if I can manage the list, you know it's not that complicated. Um, and to, to your point, you have all the resources here. It just takes someone that's willing to manage it. It's, it's not a lot of legwork, but as more people get on it that are relevant to whatever concerns you're trying to deal with, it really try to diversify it. I'm talking everything from Vermont, Vermont Farmers Food Center to whatever. You know, um, it's amazing. And when people need a need met, that could be the difference between success and failure in their life in this difficult thing we're calling just re recovery needs for life in general. So, do, I would you, do you have a listserv that everybody yes. is on yeah. here? Yes. Not a listserv. That's good. I'm sorry, I'm like, my butt is on fire over here. So we do have, we don't have like a listserv, but in Rankin Grand Isle County, there was a community partnership that was statewide and it was funded. The funding was mandated in 2008, but in Franklin Grand Isle County, we committed, we continue to meet. So on the first Wednesday of the month, I am the first, I'm the person who does the attendance. We have 52 partnerships that are sometimes at the table at the same time, but they're always on the mailing list. So the updates are given. We have the housing, I was at a housing review team meeting today, so the housing review team meeting participants are there. We have our recovery, we've got the healthcare, we've got nonprofits. I mean, there's 52 partners there, so it's a good one-stop shop. And we also have, in December, we have our legislators that are there, and then also in June. So it's a great time for us to be able to, to voice what's going on in the community for Franklin Grand Isle County. And at the same time, we have presenters each month. So we've had for the, the Samson grant, we've had Franklin County Area Communities, we've had United Way. So that's a great way that there's a half hour that is designated for networking before the meeting starts. Um, and I was looking for Kristen or Joe or Deb, but the four of us are the executive lead team members for that. So if there's any communication that needs to go out, we can do that as well. But I think that's kind of the starting point for that one-stop shop. So even reaching one of us for lead team members, we can say, okay, we have so-and-so who's on the housing review team meetings or on creative workforce solutions. And I think that's kind of a Franklin Grand Isle County. We took initiative to continue meeting, and it's a really strong team. So I really encourage anybody, a lot of people that I see here go to that meeting. I really encourage anybody who hasn't to plug in. As soon as you attend one time, then you get the updates. It's one weekly update by Joe Conco. We've had law enforcement. We have been able to highlight. We also have two NCSS workers in our area. One is at the St. Albans Barracks, and one is at the State Trooper Barracks. So those crisis workers are full-time embedded in those locations, and they have, law enforcement loves them for obvious reasons, so that's something we're hoping to maybe do further down the road with recovery coaches and through recovery support workers. So I have to put in a shameless plug for the partnership. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Billing said to me earlier tonight that it, it, you can measure our meeting, meetings in Franklin County and the number of hugs given when everyone arrives. And I think that part of that is the partnership because everyone meets every month. Um, but I do think that there may be some value in what Commander Friday was describing in terms of having something where you can put out a site that say, I've got a family that needs a set of bunk beds. I've got a family that needs a refrigerator. I've got someone, you know, so that you can get that kind of physical, immediate needs met in a way that uh, I don't think we can right now. And that would certainly have some, some value, I think. Um, Champaign Housing Trust does that. They have 80 parties. They're the best Right, but the, I don't know that you can put out a, a call to 400 people and say, hey, I need a refrigerator for somebody and get it within 15 minutes. Not <laughs> 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 but that's, I think that adds like a list right there of people we need to get together. And this man knows how to do it. Oh, this can be our next project. <laughs> 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 so before we wrap it up, we're at 7.30.
and a little bit over. Is there anything else that anyone would like to, to ask, to comment on, to suggest that we work on next? I, I do want to, to add one comment. Um, we did a, a series, and two of those who were involved in it are, are here tonight, um, Melinda and Jody, uh, where some folks talked about their experiences with addiction and recovery. We did this back in January, and Olivia is one of our reporters wrote it, and it started with that question of what can we as a community do to address this problem? And that's where Elaine and I started when she began working on that. And at the end of the series, she sat down with Jody and Melinda and another person from Turning Point. Oh, okay. And with Hal. With Hal. And Hal actually made the comment that one of the things that folks needed from the community, goes back to what Amanda Prouty said earlier, was simply to know that people cared about them and to be engaged in the community in things that talk about recovery, like being ready to play a softball team. You know, some things that, that made people not defined by their addiction, but that let them know that they were welcome and that they welcome that they were welcome in the community and valued parts of the community. Um, so, and that that I think is as crucial. Keeping people uh, in recovery is as crucial as preventing them from using in the first place. I think for the long-term health of our communities. Um, so, with that, I will give it to Kathy. She has any closing remarks. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, so I, I have what I used to call a parking lot up there where I've been taking notes. Um, I was informed by Betsy Conier, however, that it needed to be called a bike rack because it was much happier. <laughs> so over there is the bike rack. I took some notes, and certainly um, there are some items that our um, task force to reduce substance abuse, Sandy doesn't like the name of the group, but we're going to work on that. Um, we'll be meeting on and we'll be reaching out to uh, many of you. I see Mary Pickner is here, who's also a member of our team. Um, and we do have a ways to go. Um, I think, um, you know, I've experienced an individual or two that are going through um, treatment and recovery. And i got to say, if I didn't have Mary on the end of the phone because I knew Mary, um, then I would have had a struggle trying to figure out how to support them. So um, we have a ways to go yet. But with models, um, right, um, Project Vision, we'll get there. We're going to be going to Project Vision. Okay, Matthew, we're coming back. We went two years ago, a group of us in this room. If you're really, really interested, um, let me know. We're going to go back and visit them again. And and Jolinda, um, we might bring you with us. Okay. Thanks. Oh, and Michelle just committed a reporter. We're on the road. <laughs> So thank you again very much. Thank you to our keynote speakers for coming all the way up north for us. Um, have a safe ride home. And of course, to our regional um, experts um, that uh, don't all think they're experts, but we really are. Thank you. Thank you.